We're here to talk about Bourdieu Socio Theory. Uh, have you ever heard about Bourdieu? Okay, okay, you are in the good talk. So, we're here to talk about uh, cultural capital, about access, about symbolic violence and about what the fuck with all that and tech, right? And before I enter in all those, those things, right, I would like to tell you some disclaimers. One, this is a model. All models are wrong, some are useful. I think this one is useful. Doesn't mean that it doesn't have limitations, it has limitations, and any models have limitations, right? It's not a perfect description of reality. Second, I'm not a sociologist, I'm just a geek. Third, uh, this presentation will contain typos. <clears throat> and final, final disclaimer, I bring no solutions to the problem in this press at all. I just talk about a problem and I talk about how to identify it and we have fuck all of solutions to this, okay? With this, this all in mind, let's talk about Bourdieu Social Theory. So Bourdieu Social Theory is kind of a plate of spaghetti. It's kind of complex and with many interactions between them. And I just took three spaghettis today with you and dip down on those three separately. And of course, this makes no sense by itself. Those spaghettis will interwind, and they weigh more than three. Bourdieu have found like hundreds, and it's kind of infinite, okay? I have this bad voice because I was sick, so if any moment you don't understand me, just raise your hand or throw something at me or something like that. So, Without further ado, let's talk about symbolic violence. So, Pierre Bourdieu was this sexy sociologist, right? And, he, and he, in his, as any sociologist is wont to do, he tried to create a model of how a society works, with, which we call the Bourdieu socio theory, okay? And one of the things in his model, one of the spaghettis in his plate, dishes spaghetti, was uh, symbolic violence. So what is symbolic violence? It has to do with the icon of power. So the idea is every society has its own drawing, its own idea, it's an icon of how someone that is normal that this person holds power looks like, right? So uh, it changes over time, it changes over time. The, the, the icon of power evolves and changes. Uh, at some decades ago, it, uh, some centuries ago, it was normal that the person with power to be fat and today is not in our society, right? Uh, because being fat meant that you could work, you would, do not need heavy work in order to sustain yourself. And today, being malnourished means you'll be fat, and being, uh, being fit means you have the money to go to the gym. Things like that, right? 
So you have the, the cultural capital means you have the symbolic capital means you have the icon of power, which is drawn, is an icon drawn with an infinite amount of traits, like a certain way of dressing. Right? A way of dressing in itself, or with a certain uh, body size, let's say, or uh, with a certain color of skin, uh, or with a certain uh, gender. Oh. Uh, so it is drawn by that, right? Rolexes, for example, right? accessories. And the whole idea is the more of those traits you have, the closer you are to this icon of power. And the closer you are to this icon of power, the more uh, normal it is in the mind of people that you hold power. And the further you are, the less normal it looks when you hold power. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay. Of course, this is more complex than that. There is a, something I'm not talking about today in bourgeois social theory. There is the concept of fields. There is the, f but you, you have an icon of power per field. I just talked about society at large, but you could. It's more complex than that. So, uh, being closer to the icon of power itself is not a pro is not the violence. In the symbolic violence is a violence we do to ourselves. So the whole point is, you, when you are with someone that is closer to the icon of power, you are conditioned to submit to that person. So that, that's the symbolic violence. It's the violence you're conditioned to do to yourself in order to submit to someone that is closer to the icon of power. Does it make sense? So, thing is, uh, at this point, some people will say, so it's like a psychological bias, and fair warning, and talk about sociology today, not about psychology today at all. So, uh, something, uh, I mean, we could talk about psychology of this, but it's just not the subject of this talk, okay? So, that to make a little bit of a difference, Sorry to any sociologists seeing this, but to make a, we're talking about a whole different uh, scheme of things. Um, like, for example, Mona Lisa uh, in the Louvre. How many times have someone tried to break the Mona Lisa with a hammer? In the last 800 years, it happened twice. Right? It's an infrequent but very violent thing. Yeah? First time the guy was stopped before he could approach the Mona Lisa, and we put a bulletproof case around the Mona Lisa. Right? The second time we discovered the bulletproof case worked against hammers. <laughs> right? From a psychological point of view, trying to break the Mona Lisa with a hammer is probably at higher violence than try to touch a statue, right? From a sociological point of view, though, trying to break a Mona Lisa with a hammer is probably less of a violence than try to touch a statue. Why? Because if we just take out the guards and let it, things be themselves, all things considered, it's probably not going to happen that people will break the Mona Lisa with a hammer. It's just been stopped. And twice in 800 years is not a very frequent statistical thing, right? But if you just let everyone that wants to touch a statue touch a statue, after one year, you don't have much many st more, more many statues in the Louvre. Does it make sense? There is no no things so small that you can, could repeat millions and millions of times and have no consequence of that. Yes? It's also the attacking Mona Lisa with a hammer. Attacking Mona Lisa with a hammer probably uh, uh, contains its symbolic uh, value, whereas if you can touch statues that diminishes their symbolic value. 
Maybe. But uh, on the Archimedes schemes, what I'm trying to push here is something that happens something that happens millions and millions and millions of times. Even though something seems smaller, it gains a higher a higher power over, over to society. Yes? Have you seen those bronze statues that are discolored a little bit? Because people touch it a lot. Right? A, if a small violence repeated a lot is a bigger violence in the whole of society than this smaller violence done very rarely. Yes? Okay. With that in mind, when I talk about symbolic violence, I talk about, I talk about a social construct. I talk about what is in mind of people, but the thing, something we construct in the society itself. Okay? Okay. So, what happens in symbolic violence is when you see someone that is closer to the icon of power, you submit a little bit to that person. It's, just, it's not a 100% thing. It's not every single human being doing this all the time. It's just a average of society doing this a lot. And, and as do, in doing so, you create an hierarchy and you lend that person power and you inflict vi symbolic violence over yourself. So symbolic violence is kind of insidious in which the person benefiting from it can not see it at all. The person suffer it though. The person suffering it is condemned to suffer it, is condemned to enforce it. to doubt and being doubted about it existing. It's condemned to educate about it. So it's kind of a very good deal for the person that benefits from it, right? So, when you suffer from symbolic violence, you, you are yourself the actor of the violence, yourself the sufferer of the violence, yourself the only person seeing it. And, we, and then you have society doubting about it, and yourself having doubts about it. Whereas when you benefit from it, you can just ignore that it exists at all. You have no honors. Just the benefit. Cool, right? <coughs> so let's talk about cultural capital. Oh, no, sorry. Symbolic, in symbolic violence, there's something that is very interesting, is the concept of blink. So have you ever heard about uh, dress for success? Right? Some level of symbolic violence, you can try to have it in a conscious level. You, you, could, you can try to dress in better ways or something like that. You can try to buy a Rolex, right? At some point, you could do to, uh, try to do this on purpose. Most is not on purpose, but some of it can be on purpose, and some of it is on purpose, yes? Uh, but the thing is, there is just so, so much you can wear and buy with money. And at some level, it's just not possible. I, I mean. You cannot change the color of your skin, right? But uh, you, can, uh, you can probably try to buy a suit, right? Have you ever seen someone that is really bad at dressing in a suit? Really not fit into it, right? It's just not because you bought a suit or a Rolex that you can actually wear it in a believable way, yes? It's not, just owning it is not everything. Symbolic <laughs> violence is not something you can perfectly buy. And that's what we call the bling effect. 
is the new rich person effect. This, this is a, a president of a country that was very bling. He, uh, he was very rich, and he gave himself way more signifiers of symbolic violence that were really usable by him, right? OK. And there is another effect in symbolic violence that I find quite interesting, is what we call the reversion of symbolic violence. So a reversal of symbolic violence is when you decrease one of the traits in order to increase your overall symbolic violence. For example, uh, you dress like a bum, but you are so high in many other traits that this decrease actually increases your overall violence. Like, I don't know, uh, some dude, right? Does it make sense? OK, so let's talk about cultural capital. Hi, I'm Romeo. I work for a company called the Boston Consulting Group. I organize a conference that is in Paris, that you should probably try to go to that. And I am in Twitter with Mark Zamef because simplicity. So, cultural capital, cultural capital. Bourdieu would defend that uh, culture was a capital, ca capital like finance is a capital. It's something that you can just piggy bank and have a lot of it. And the more you have, the easier you have, it is to have more of it. Does it make sense? So, uh, how does that, how does that work? Every single thing in your life has a price in cultural capital. It's just invisible. Yeah? When you try to enter, have you ever tried to enter a museum in your life? Yeah, okay. Do you live in a city with a lot of, lots of museums? Yeah? Have you been to a museum and it just so happened that you do not get anything. <laughs> right, right, it happens, right, it happens. And what happened at that moment is that the ne minimum needed cultural capital in order to enter that exhibition was higher than your current cultural capital, yeah? More or less. Uh, I mean, it's not always that, but you get my point. Uh, you have an, an access needed. Yeah. It opens doors to have a minimum of no, knowledge about something. It opens doors to have a minimum of cultural capital here, to have amassed a minimum of culture in order to go to things. And uh, have you been to a library in your life? Do, do you know about libraries? Have you heard about them? It's like co-working spaces, but free. <laughs> and, and they also have books. It's kind of neat. And, uh, and, and the thing is, uh, libraries, uh, the fact that libraries exist and they are free itself is something you all know, but there are people that don't, right? Those people that don't, they are lacking this piece of cultural capital of libraries are free, right? And if they had that, then they would have a second problem, which is, how can I use a library? I know those, all those books are here, but how, where do you start, right? And, and not to even talk about having time and things like that. Just, just the basics of, I have the time I'm here, how do I use this, right? All this is a cultural capital that you have today. And many people don't. Does it make sense? Okay. You amass culture like billionaires amass money. 
So what is cool about cultural capital is that it never goes down, right? Unlike money, it's not, you don't need to spend it to enter in places. You just need to show you have this many, right? It's like, it's like if money worked in a way that you just have to show how much money you have in your bank account and never need to spend it, right? But it becomes easier to have more when you have already a lot. Yeah? Okay. Have you ever been to a uh, contemporary art museum? Okay, have you ever seen a contemporary art museum and say, this is bullshit? Okay, do you still say that? Okay, so, so I used to be a person like that. Just a parenthesis here on the whole presentation. I used to be a person like that. Let me try to help you with your cultural capital today. <laughs> so, uh, have you been seen that um, in, Lou, in the Pompidou, they have this white panel painting. It's, un, it's called Untitled. Untitled. Yes, this one, right? One of my favorite paintings. Okay, this is not working. Right, completely white, right? Have, have you seen that? Do you look at this and say, this is bullshit? Right, if you look at this and say, this is bullshit, I would like you to take a, take a moment and appreciate that. Contemporary art tries to subvert the dichotomy of object and subject. When you are looking, when I look in the museum and look at this, and there is somebody there in front of that and say, this is bullshit, that person there saying, this is bullshit, that person is part of the art piece. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, and, and if you accept that, then you can no longer look at this in the same way again, right? What I, ju what I just did is that I changed your perception of it. I hear your thought, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, that change the perception of it. Why? Because cultural capital changes the perception you have of things. It changes how you perceive the world itself. When you increase your cultural capital, the sky is no longer blue, it's Silurian, right, for the rest of your life. Deep down you know it, right? You now can look at this and see in a different way. It may be for you it's still bullshit, but it's a different bullshit now. Right? It's no longer the same one. But the point here is, for me, is I, I understand exactly, right? But you think, then what's the point of, of looking at it? Am I looking at people? And then do I, I feel like I'm laughing at the people. Yes, right. I think that's kind of also me. Kind of, kind of horrible, right? Yeah. So, and, and, and this is, becomes a whole other discussion, right? I, I, I will not enter into this now, but totally. Yeah. And the thing is, it becomes a lot, okay, if it's, it's a lot looking at people, then it's not, it's, it is bad or something like that. Yeah. And at the end of the day, two things are true now. One, you cannot never look at this in the same way. Two, you, this has now touched you more than the average piece of painting in the Louvre, right? You like some paintings, but, but, but average, right? That not every single piece of usually fine painting in the Louvre has the same effect as this one in you right now, right? Which means it worked. <laughs> right? It worked. So with this in mind, with this in mind, Okay, okay, okay. So that, that's a very important question, which is, can we do art on accident? And this, this really, I mean, this was already a parenthesis in the talk. I will get completely sidetracked, talking about uh, 
epiphany and epiphany and the words in that in art, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And let's have the discussion in coffee later or, or mate. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so cultural capital changes your perception of the universe. What's What's said about this, this is good, but what is said about this is now you also perceive people that perceive what you are now perceiving. Right. You, you now see that, oh, man, those people here, they now have the same perception of, as I have of this thing, and those people there don't, right? So it kind of creates a separation between people, right? You now have your people, those people that know about this, and the people that don't know about this, yeah? You know, you know, no longer, when you talked about this white painting, you cannot look at it the same way, but now when you see people looking at this and say, this is bullshit, you cannot look at them at the same way too, right? Okay, when you accept this, then you have to accept a, a third thing about cultural capital, which is when you interact with someone of a higher cultural capital, you perceive a smallness in yourself. You are conditioned to feel lessened while interacting with someone that is a way higher cultural capital than you. And seeing that person as superior. And that happens even if that person is completely ignorant about the subject where you are the expert in the subject. Which is awesome, right? And you also condition <coughs> also when you are looking at two other people with difference between them. When you're looking at two people, and those two people, they have different levels of cultural capital, and they're discussing between them. If the person with the lesser cultural capital is the expert of the subject, you tend to feel that the person with a higher cultural capital is a little bit writer. Yeah? That's great. It works quite well, right? Which brings us back to another the icon of power that was the question of clothes, right? And race and sex, gender and uh, accessories, accents. But there were also something that I like a lot, which is the lux luxury of calmness. So when you look at someone that is calm, that person is perceived as being more powerful than someone that is angry. Even if the person that is angry has all the reasons to be angry, and calmness was not the good thing right now. Yeah? OK. And we look at someone that is, seems more cultured and more calm. Those things interact between them, right? The more cultural capital you have, and the more close you are to the icon of power, both together interact and reach each other a lot. And they also feed each other a lot. It's way easier to amass cultural capital when you have a lot of symbolic violence. And way easier to get yourself a lot of symbolic violence when you already have a lot of cultural capital. Yay! So, let's talk about Let's talk about social capital. Social capital in Bourdieu's social theory is a lot, a lot of, a lot of like cultural capital, but you change culture by, you change the culture by your relationships. It's way easier to get a lot of relationships when you already have a lot of relationships. And it's way easier to get more culture when you have a lot of relationships or get more relationships when you have a lot of culture. Make sense? Good, good, good. Let's talk about X's. X's? Where did I put X's? I did write this somewhere. Uh, right. 
corpus habitus exit. I will not try to explain all this, all the all this stuff in detail. This will be, I mean, oh yeah, disclaimer, disclaimer. This is like six months in university. I'm trying to squish in 45 minutes. There will be gross over simplifications. So, on, this, on all of these gross over simplifications, right? Axis. Uh, axis is a lot about, block, lot like an hour, just not that at all. Is okay. So the habitus. The habitus is a lot about uh, like an hour, but not that at all. The habitus is this whole nonverbal communication you have. The whole thing you are in front of other people. Make sense? And X is a very specific form of habitus. It's an habitus of I belong here. I'm legitimate. So this whole difference between courage versus the marity. Have you heard about that? No, what's the marity? So, yeah, um, when you're courageous, when you're brave, you feel the fear and you brave that fear, right? You go beyond that fear. When a temerary, you don't feel the fear at all, right? A baby is a very temerary thing, right? Has no knowledge about the dangers of the world. And hence, it's very easy for them to die, right? They, they can just fall, off a, fall over a cliff. They, they don't know it's dangerous, so they don't care, yeah? A baby is not a very brave thing, right? As soon as they understand some danger, then they know deep shit and afraid of that danger, yeah? It's a very fine distinction. So, Axis is like the marriage. Axis is to self confidence, like the marriage is to courage. What happens is we have this whole idea of self confidence, of it being a very important thing, Fe feeling stable, feeling confident, yeah? And uh, when you look at outside someone, and you, from the outside, and the person seems very confident, it seems that the person belongs there. OK. I, access is when the person was pushed to believe in, since the, the inception, since birth, by the whole society, to believe, I belong here. And pushed to believe that everywhere. Yes? And hence, they just naturally behave like they belong everywhere they are. Someone that is self-confident, they ask themselves, do I belong here? And the answer is yes. Someone that has access, they just tell themselves, why are people asking that question at all? The question makes no sense. Does it make sense? It's two very different situations to be in. I used to be a, uh, a friend of mine. She, she came from a very poor background and, and come, come closer to our background here. And we entered a mall together and she took her uh, bag and went to show to the mall guard. And she said, hey, we have to show this to mall guard. And I was like, oh, at the exact moment, I discovered the existence of the mall guard. He was there every day, probably. But I, I never knew at all. 
you see the difference? What happens is the mall guard, like any human being, because we are all lazy fucks, he always look, he's always looking for deviations of the norm, for behaviors that doesn't seem to fit the overall normalization of behaviors around him, right? We always looking, always looking for that. For people that are looking like they don't belong here. So if you if the person just starting doubt, doubting themselves, then they start to have those behaviors that show they look they look like they don't belong here, right? And hence it's interesting to look for them. And if you just have a lot of self-confidence and just look like naturally belong here, then no reason to look at you, right? Uh, there is a whole lot of Twitter accounts that are just people that, whose daily job is trying to penetrate into buildings, taking this in consideration, right? There's a whole industry of that. Physical pen testers, yeah? People do, who do, just know this exists, so they just play a part and enter into buildings and go across security protocols and things like that. I mean, there are many. My favorite is Chinksack. But you can, you can find many. So, <coughs> sorry. So, with this in mind, in any work situation, when you are working with someone and the person seems to be more confident that the things to be done are the things that needed to be done, the person just seems writer. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, the, 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 per the person just seems writer, right? And, uh, and if someone seems to be doubting themselves, that person just seems to be less right Somehow. But what happens is, sometimes doubting is the good thing to do. We all know that, deep down. There is no deep down time to confidence towards being right. It's very easy to be the right person and be doubting yourself. And it's very easy to be a complete fuck that always believes in himself, even if they are completely wrong. Yeah? Yet, we are conditioned to do otherwise. Okay, let's take all those three together because we have a, like seven minutes. Okay. With all those in mind, how does those, those apply to our work? Yeah? Have you ever been to Agile project? Yeah, Agile, yes. Awesome, right? Awesome. Uh, agility was created by 17 white men. Yeah? What is the probability they created something here that took the, all those things I just said in consideration. Right? Nothing. new. No. I'm not saying Agile is a bad thing, right? I'm just saying the best things we know how to handle projects in our industry are basically created out of blindness. And all those things I just described are described in a way that in all those cases, the person that benefits from them are ignorant. And the person, person that is punished by them are the only ones seeing this, right? So we created a system that to maintain itself relies on the person benefiting from all this being ignorant and blind to their own privilege. So what I'm trying to tell you today, and if you only understand one thing from this, is, from this talk today, is kill all illusions of merit. Meritocracy is all ages divine mandate of kings. So, uh, sorry? Uh, yeah, there's no queens. Uh, <laughs> so we have the, this whole idea of the divine mandate of kings. Ever heard about that? 
Right, yeah, right. The, the whole idea that the kings were in power because they deserved, didn't deserve, because God chosen them, right? And we replaced it with this idea of merit, this idea of people that are in power are there because they deserve to be there out of the work they did, yeah? So how many of you are the 1% richer in the world? Yeah, yeah. So if you Google how much money you need to be in the 1% richer, you understand that it's $35,000 per year of salary. 34, 34, right? 30, $34 per year of salary before taxes, right? And, and the thing is, you don't need any capital to be 1% richer. You could be uh, at the end of every month uh, with a bank account at zero and it still be 1% rich. You just need 34,000 of salary per year. It just means that most people are poor, right? Who are here as 1% richer in the world? Are you in the 1% richer? Do you have at least 34,000? Oh yeah, right, way more hands up now. Way, welcome, welcome. Uh, have you ever worked with people that have gave up? People that, yeah, right, people that, that just try to clock nine to five and just go back to home at, as soon as it's getting in, try to do the minimal effort here not to be fired. Ever worked with them? Yeah. If you became one of them, would you leave the 1% richer? No, right? Welcome to the case system. You deserve nothing. <laughs> nothing. You are within a case. You are within a case. And if you do a lot of effort, you, you can, within that case, go up or down. And if you leave, decide to give up completely, you will still be within that case. Yeah? And billions of people out there will never, ever be in that case, no matter how much effort they put. There is no merit. There is no meritocracy. Your privilege is there to make all your effort visible or less visible, okay? With that in mind, uh, the only thing we can do is try to find a solution. And like I said in the beginning, there is no solution to this. Why, why do I not propose a solution right now? First, because I only have two minutes. Second, <laughs> second, because I am a very high privileged person. I am like, I'm white and a man and uh, hiding the symbolic violence in cultural capital and things like that, right? If I propose that solution right now, it would be exactly like the agile guys in the beginning, some, in 2001, right? Which means my solutions will have the, my blindness to them, yeah? And if I said, okay, so I should not because I have this blindness, Let's ask all the people that are under the oppression of this to find a solution, yeah? Then, then, then the person suffering it, they, cannot, they are, have suffering, enforcing, doubting, educating, and now I want to add, <laughs> find a goddamn solution. Doesn't seem very fair to either, yeah? With that in mind, we're screwed. So uh, I, I, had, I only have a very humble proposition today, which is we should be co-constructing together a solution, right? The people that are blind to this and the people that are suffering from it should be constructing a solution together. And in order to do that, uh, we kind of need to be able to have those conversations. In order to have those conversations, you kind of need a, basi a basis of a glossary of how to talk about those things, which is the only reason I ever did this talk, is to give you that and invite you to discuss with people. And that's basically everything I want to tell you. Thank you very much. <laughs>